Hello, Namaskar. This is First Post and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Sharma. West Asia remains tense after the assassinations and strikes in Beirut and Tehran yesterday. Today was the day of funerals, also the day of deliberations. Iran has convened its regional proxies. Will they give a symbolic response to Israel or will they attack to hurt? A bigger war cannot be ruled out. Meanwhile, new details have emerged about Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh's assassination in Iran. We'll bring you all of it. The conflict is spilling into the Paris Games as well. Israeli athletes are getting death threats and being greeted with Nazi salutes and chants. In Nigeria, the nationwide protest against the government has begun, complete with a toolkit for protesters that says, get sunscreen and power banks to keep your phones charged. In the UK, for all the talk of secularism and multiculturalism, the Southport riots expose their Islamophobia. In India, poor urban planning meets climate change. Heavy rains cause chaos in cities. In Pakistan, attempts to crush the Baloch protest in Gwadar, why India's market regulator is curbing the derivatives trade. We'll explain what's happening here. Why a French dinner for the British king last year is now caught in controversy. Why Elon Musk has challenged Venezuelan President Maduro to a fight. What's with the matcha madness that has gripped the world? And our brand new segment starting today, we bring you the joke of the day. The headlines first. It's the biggest multi-country prisoner swap since the Cold War. Russia frees American reporter Ivan Gershkovich. Former US Marine Paul Whelan has also been released. Moscow had jailed both of them on espionage charges. Under the deal, the US and its allies will also return Russian prisoners. Bangladesh bans the Jamaat-e-Islami under the anti-terrorism law. Its student wing has also been banned. The Sheikh Hasina government accuses them of instigating the job quota protests. The demonstrations led to nationwide unrest that killed at least 150 people. Family doctors in England will stage their first industrial action in 60 years. There are over 8,000 general practitioners in the country. 98% voted in favour of collective action because of a row over funding. This could bring the state-funded National Health Service to a standstill. Pakistan's second largest city, Lahore, hit by record rainfall. Streets submerged, hospitals flooded and schools and offices closed. An emergency has been declared. Lahore is home to 13 million people. In 2022, a third of Pakistan was submerged by unprecedented monsoon rains. July was the hottest month in China since records began six decades ago. This summer, heat waves have scorched parts of northern China, while rains triggered floods and landslides in central and southern parts of the country. Beijing is the world's biggest emitter of greenhouse gases. And the European Union's landmark law on artificial intelligence comes into force. It's the world's first sweeping rule to govern systems like OpenAI's chat GPT. Companies have to comply by 2026. But rules covering models like ChatGPT will apply within 12 months. It was the day of funerals in West Asia, in Tehran, in Baghdad and in Beirut. Three countries, three cities and three processions. Let's look at Tehran first. The city was mourning Ismail Haniye, the assassinated chief of Hamas. He was in Tehran to attend the Iranian president's inauguration, but Israel took him out. He was killed in an explosion on Wednesday. 
and the details are slowly coming out. Reports say the bomb was smuggled into the guest house two months ago. The same guest house where Hanie would stay. After that, it was a waiting game. Israel first confirmed that Hanie was inside the building. Then they detonated the bomb remotely. Of course, Israel has not confirmed any of this. They haven't even admitted to killing Ismail Hanie. But Ira Iran does not need an admission. They know whom to blame. Iran's supreme leader led the prayers at Hanie's funeral. Afterwards, there was a massive procession. Thousands lined the streets to pay their respects. Take a look at this. There's an outpouring of grief, not just in Iran, but across the Muslim world. Protests were organized in Turkey, in Lebanon, in Jordan, in the West Bank, and even in Pakistan. These people may love him, but his legacy is complicated. Ismail Haniel led a terror organization, a group that killed thousands of innocent Israelis. Which brings us to the second funeral today. In Beirut, Israel had struck a southern suburb of the city. Their target was, his, was a Hezbollah commander. They did manage to take him out, but three civilians were also killed. The third funeral was in Iraq. It wasn't Israel's doing though. This attack was carried out by the United States. They struck a militia base in the Babel province. Around four pro-Iran fighters were killed here. Their funeral was held in Baghdad. Hundreds gathered for this procession. So three cities are in grief, but will that grief turn into revenge? That's the big worry at this point. A new president has just taken charge in Tehran. He will want to stamp his authority and reports say the supreme leader has signed off. He wants a direct attack on Israel. Iran is also convening its proxies, the Hezbollah, the Hamas and Houthis. Maybe the idea is to plan a joint response. Now you may remember the last time Iran attacked in April. They launched hundreds of drones at Israel, but the damage was minimal. Apparently, that was the point. Maximum symbolism, minimum impact. But will Iran do the same thing again? Or will they look to cause significant damage this time? Well, Israel is, is warning against it. They say revenge attacks will be punished. Since the strike in Beirut, there are threats sounding from all directions. We are prepared for any scenario, and we will stand united and determined against any threat. Israel will exact a very heavy price for any aggression against us from any arena. Put yourself in the shoes of the Supreme Leader. Hanie was the political chief of Hamas. Not your general or officer, just a proxy of your regime. Do you risk all-out war for a slain proxy? Or would you rather respond with restraint? Maybe with performative strikes? Logic says that Iran would not risk an all-out war, but these are rogue leaders taking call, so who knows? Israel's bigger challenge is the Hezbollah. That attack not only killed a top commander, it also killed two children. So public anger is building up there. They want speedy revenge against Israel. Plus Hezbollah is already exchanging fire with Israel, so it's not a new front. It's an expansion of an existing battle. And most countries have realized this. They've asked citizens in Lebanon to leave immediately, and that includes India. The Indian mission released a statement today. All Indian nationals have been asked to leave. So it looks like the Lebanon front will heat up, especially if Iran asks Hezbollah to hit back. The question is, is there still room for diplomacy to somehow reduce the tensions? 
Well, the UN Security Council convened on Wednesday. It went about as well as you would expect a meeting like this. There was bickering, insults, and open threats. Iran's arming of terrorist groups in Syria, Lebanon, and Iraq is similarly destabilizing and contrary to efforts by the Security Council to de-escalate regional tensions. Every member of this council should call on Iran to stop arming, advising, and financing terrorist groups and to rein in the actions of proxies and partners who threaten regional peace and security. The responsibility of the United States as a strategic ally and main supporters of the Israeli regime in the region cannot be overlooked in this horrific crime. This act could not be occurred without the authorization and intelligence support of the U.S. A lot of allegations, a lot of threats, but no solutions. Russia and China have sided with Iran. The West is firmly with Israel. So the Security Council is deadlocked. Do not expect any miracles from it. But what about the United States? How do they plan to handle this? If Iran's proxies gang up on Israel, we would be in uncharted territory. Netanyahu would need help from the United States, and Washington stands ready to do it. If Israel is attacked, we certainly uh, will help defend Israel. You, see, you saw us do that in April. Uh, you can expect to see us do that again. But we, we don't want to see any of that happen. So the U.S. doesn't want a war. But if Israel is attacked, they will join. Plus, they're holding secret talks in West Asia. A White House official was in Saudi Arabia. Meanwhile, a European official was in Tehran. I must say, this is shaping up to be a repeat of April. Asking Iran to take symbolic actions, roping in the Arab allies, and publicly promising to defend Israel. So I guess it's all up to Iran now. Their leaders did show some restraint during the last attack. Let's see if they have more patience left. Palestinian supporters are showing no restraint, though. We're talking about the Paris Olympics now. From the matches to the Olympic venues, even on the streets of Paris, there is palpable tension, especially for Israeli athletes. Last weekend, there was a football match. Israel faced off against Paraguay. The crowd gave the Israeli team a hostile reception. Take a look. You heard that right. They were chanting, Hail Hitler. It's a Nazi greeting to glorify the regime that carried out the genocide of Jews. Remember, six million people died in the Holocaust, the horror perpetrated by Hitler and Nazi Germany. This crowd was cheering it. They were also making anti-Semitic gestures and waving the Palestinian flag. This is not a peaceful protest. This is pure hate. And Israeli athletes face this every day, over and over again. They have been targeted with death threats. The French police have, has opened an investigation. Israel's foreign minister reached out to his French counterpart and he issued a warning. Israel claims that Iran is plotting an attack to target Israeli athletes and tourists in France. Now, this is a very serious charge. France cannot take it lightly, also because there's already been a security breach. Personal information of Israeli athletes has been leaked. Iranian hackers are being blamed for this. They created fake social media channels and made the stolen data public, data about Israeli athletes, their personal information. And they've been sending out messages. This is what they look like. Israeli athletes have been getting messages like these. It's like an invitation to their own funeral. Can you imagine how disturbing this can be for players who are already performing in a high-pressure environment? Security of the Israeli athletes has been tightened. They now have 24-7 protection. Elite tactical units escort them everywhere. And for weeks now, the security challenge has persisted. Israel's participation in these games remains a subject of controversy. The Palestinians campaigned hard to have them blocked, to get the organizers to not let Israel participate. We have written to both IOC and FIFA and raised all the points I mentioned. We posed a specific question and asked the IOC to clarify whether the breach of the Olympic truce, implementation of the apartheid regime, annexation of the Palestinian territory, 
and Israeli athletes being members of the occupying forces will bring a change in the IOC policy towards Israel's participation in international sports. Palestinian athletes have also raised their voice on this, like boxer Wasim Abu Sal. Look at what he wore for the opening ceremony. It's an outfit depicting the war in Gaza. It shows bombs falling on children from fighter jets. So the Palestinians tried their best to humiliate and isolate Israel, but they could not stop them from competing in the games. Public sentiment in France is also divided. Israel is still facing a strong backlash over the war in Gaza, especially over the deaths of thousands of Palestinians. Take a look at this now. Posters like these have sprung up. When it comes to killing for sport, there is no competition. That is, that is what it says. This picture shows an Olympic podium with bombs, dead bodies and flags of Israel. We don't know who is behind these posters, but they have been plastered across Paris. Even spectators are breaking into fights over this. But now Mali is getting, uh, is destroying them, I think. Israel is not bad. Israel is not bad. But no politic here. I no think, politic here. I think Mali is going to destroy no them politic here. today. Stop. No, I'm just talking about football. No I'm just, I'm just talking about football. Mali is the best. No politic here. Okay? Free, free Palestine. Free, free. Free, free. Free, free. The International Olympic Committee or the IOC insisted that the Games this year will be apolitical. But this war has divided the entire world, so how can the Olympics remain untouched? The event has a long history of political protests, from the famous Black Power Salute to the boycott of South Africa over apartheid, also the Israel-Palestine conflict. It has been at the center of one of the worst episodes in Olympic history. I'm talking about the 1972 Munich Games, when Israeli athletes were targeted by eight Palestinian militants. They stormed the Olympic Games village and took Israeli athletes hostage. Eleven of them, eleven is Israelis, were killed in this attack. It shocked the entire world. It sparked an international crisis. The shadow of that attack looms on the Paris Games this year. Israel's war in Gaza is indeed a humanitarian tragedy. There's no defending that. But nothing justifies targeting athletes at the Olympics. This is a security threat, and it must be taken seriously. Now we shift our focus to Nigeria. It is Africa's most populous country, home to over 200 million people, and a lot of those people are angry. Today, after weeks of build-up, protests have begun in Nigeria. The government has been trying to stop them. President Bola Tinubu tried every trick in the book. He increased the minimum wage. His police and military threatened the protesters. He even got the clergy to denounce the protests, but nothing worked. Angry Nigerians took to the streets across the country today, despite numerous obstacles thrown their way. We'll start with the capital, Abuja, where the protesters' movement has been restricted. A court had intervened on the behalf of the government. It confined the protesters to one particular location, to a stadium on the outskirts of the capital. Now, most of the protesters complied, but some were defiant. So they were seen marching towards the heart of the capital, but they were confronted by the police, who fired tear gas shells to disperse the crowd. Then there was Lagos, Nigeria's largest city. Again, thousands turned up to protest here. They marched through the streets with banners and posters, wanting to end bad governance and also wanting an end to hunger. We are tired of being hungry. We cannot even 
feed our children. One two bar of yam, one two bar of yam is five thousand. We cannot buy tomato, tomato and pepper. Pepper is one thousand. The poor cannot survive. Please, we need you to change the government. And we are not going to stop until every Nigerian can live comfortably in Nigeria. We are not going to stop until we in Nigeria, we Nigerians living in Nigeria, enjoy similar life or a better life than even Niger countries across the world who don't have half of the resources that we have. Some of the biggest demonstrations took place in Kano, Nigeria's second largest city, located in the north of the country. Thousands had gathered in Kano to make their voices heard. The Nigerian police fired tear gas and live bullets to scare them away. They also doused the protesters with hot water, but the demonstrators were undeterred. However, things did get ugly in Kano. Some protesters set tires ablaze near the state governor's house. The police shot at them. At least four people were wounded. So that's the situation in some of the bigger cities in Nigeria. But the protests are taking place nationwide in some form or the other. They are being organized online under the hashtag End Bad Governance. And the protesters are in it for the long haul, it seems. Look at this post. The protesters have created a list of do's and don'ts. They're telling people to wear comfortable shoes, to carry water and sunscreen and power banks so that their phones are always charged. And they can share videos of police brutality in real time. As you can see, this is, this is an extremely well-organized protest. The demonstrators are determined to bring their government to heel. Why? Because they're angry. Angry about the cost of living crisis in their country. Inflation crossed 34% in June, the worst level in 28 years. Food inflation is even higher. It was about 40% in the month of June. People are struggling to buy food. They're hungry. They want the prices to drop. President Bola Tinubu is, is being blamed for this inflation. When he came to power last year, he made a number of unpopular changes or reforms, as he likes to call them. One of these reforms was especially brutal. Tinubu removed a nationwide subsidy on fuel, and this sent prices skyrocketing. Fuel now costs three times as much as it did one year ago, three times higher. And this has had a knock-on effect. You see, when fuel prices rise, everything becomes costlier because you need fuel to transport every single thing. The protesters understand this, which is why their main demand is the restoration of the fuel subsidy. If the subsidy returns, prices are expected to crash and people should be able to afford food again. That's the theory anyway. But will Tinubu listen? We'll find out soon enough. Let's turn to Britain now. The country's ugly truth has been laid bare. All those years of multiculturalism all those decades of preaching secularism, but it's all coming crashing down. We told you about the recent stabbing in Southport. Three children were killed in a holiday club. Eight others were left injured. It was a truly horrible crime. But you know how some Britons responded to it? By attacking the Southport Mosque. They damaged the building, they torched police vehicles and assaulted police officers. Protests were also held in other parts of the country. In London, things got violent. Clashes broke out near Downing Street. Protesters threw flares and beer cans at the Prime Minister's residence. Some of them also had a slogan, Stop the Boats. It's a reference to migrants cross crossing the English Channel. A popular right-wing chant. Take a look. So let's recap the past few days. The stabbing happened on Monday. A mosque was targeted on Tuesday and protesters chanted, stop the boats on Wednesday. I know what you're thinking. The knife man must have been a Muslim migrant, except he wasn't. He is a 17 year old born to Rwandan parents in Cardiff in the UK. So neither a migrant nor a Muslim. A 17 year old boy from Banks has been charged with the murders of Bibi. Elsie Dot and Alice. Ten counts of attempted murder and possession of a bladed article following the tragic incident in Southport on Monday, the 29th of July. He appeared in court today. 
Normally, his name would not be released to public because he is underage, 17 years old. But the judge made an exception in this case. So we can tell you the name of the knife man, Alex Ruda Kubana. He stabbed and killed three children in a holiday club. And what was Britain's first reaction? To blame Muslims and migrants. This is blatant Islamophobia. It's the definition of prejudice and social media contributed to it. Many users spread lies about the attacker's identity. They claim that he was Muslim. They claim that he arrived on a boat in 2023. No evidence, no confirmation from the police, just casual hate mongering. And shame on these protesters too. You don't become Islamophobic overnight. Chances are you always were. This attack was just an opportunity to act on it, to attack and vandalize mosques. So these riots were not a sudden outburst. They reveal a deeper problem. I have some numbers for you. Let's look at the period from October to February. The UK recorded more than 2,000 anti-Muslim incidents, 2,000. The year before, this number was 600. So this is a 235% rise in one year. Some of it was triggered by the Israel-Hamas war. But like I said, Islamophobia does not happen overnight. It's the product of years of fear-mongering. And British politicians must take some of the blame. I'll give you an example. Nigel Farage leads the Reform UK party. His platform is anti-immigration. Listen to his statement on Tuesday. I have to say there are one or two questions. Uh, was this guy being monitored by the security services? Some reports say he was, others less sure. The police say it's a non-terror incident. I just wonder whether the truth is being withheld from us. I don't know the answer to that, but I think it is a fair and legitimate question. That's the definition of dog whistling. He wonders whether the police are lying about the attacker. Well, such wonderings lead to violence. They fuel hate and divide communities, and it's not just Britain. We've seen this elsewhere in the West. Economy not performing, blame the migrants. Crime on the rise, blame the Muslims. Inflation out of control, divert attention by talking about immigration. This is Western politics in a nutshell. But nobody questions them. We are told that Western countries are secular by definition. Hate politics is only for Asia or Latin America. Well, think again. A diverse population has exposed these societies. Look at what happened in France. They wanted a black pop star to sing at the Olympics opening ceremony. Her name is Aya Nakamura. She was born in Mali, but she grew up in Paris. So she is a French singer, but some people couldn't stand it. Politicians and senators pushed back at the choice. They couldn't fathom the idea of a black French singer. This was always the reality of Western society. These latest instances have simply exposed them. Now let's talk about India. Every monsoon, the country witnesses the same scenes. Flooded roads, disrupted services, and citizens wondering if the situation will get better next year. Well, spoiler alert, it won't. Take India's capital, for example. Yesterday, New Delhi witnessed heavy rainfall. Life came to a standstill. Roads are still inundated. And the problem isn't the weather. It's the poor planning. Delhi's drainage plan dates back to 1976. It still follows that nearly half a century old plan. Why is that? Why is India not upgrading its infrastructure? And how is climate change exacerbating this problem? Our next report tells you. Yesterday, India's capital was caught by surprise. Record rains submerged Delhi. Parts of the city were inundated. Roads were flooded. Even the new parliament complex was waterlogged. There were traffic jams everywhere. Flights were diverted. The capital came to a standstill. It's the same picture every monsoon season. Rains come and India's cities plunge into chaos. Take Mumbai, for example. It's India's financial capital. The monsoon season lasts for three months. It's a known fact. Yet, every year, these are the scenes. Inundated roads, flooded railway tracks, offices and schools shut, and essential services disrupted. So what explains the same pictures every single year? What are Indian cities doing wrong? 
Well, it's a mix of three things. Rapid urbanization, bad planning and climate change. Historically, Indian cities haven't had much of a problem with this. They had natural drains, so there was minimal flooding. But then came rapid urbanization. Our cities grew bigger. Water bodies turned into localities for people to live in and thus began the problem. Take Bengaluru, for example. Three decades ago, the built-up area in the city was 27%. In 2021, it was 86%. And it's the case with every major city in India. In the last decade, urban population has gone from 391 million to 500 million. By 2050, it could reach 900 million. Our cities are overburdened. Space has to be made for the burgeoning population, which means unending construction. Concrete replacing green spaces. Canals and water bodies being closed off, leaving these cities unable to absorb or drain water. Then there's bad planning. Look at Delhi, for example. The drainage plan that the city follows is from 1976. That's a 48-year-old plan and it's still being used. There have been efforts to make a new one, but Delhi hasn't been able to upgrade its infrastructure. It's the same for Mumbai, a city with a population of 22 million people and its traffic is one of the worst in the world. But the city still doesn't have a functional metro network. It's been in the works for a while now. New York got its metro network in 1904. Shanghai got it in 1993. Even Delhi got it in 2002. So it's long overdue. But urbanization and bad planning aside, there's the added problem of climate change. Just look at what's happening across the country. Landslides in Vyanad. Cloud bursts in Himachal Pradesh. It's freak weather and it's turbocharged by climate change. But is the country prepared for it? Well, not really. Its climate policy is lacking, and if it doesn't change, it will not only affect how we live, but it will also affect our economy. In 2023, floods in North India led to a loss of over a billion dollars. In 2018, the recovery cost after the Kerala floods was $3.5 billion. We can't afford this, so India needs to upgrade its infrastructure and tackle the climate challenge head-on or else we will be left wading in water year after year. Is there a bubble in the Indian stock market? For several months now, Indian stocks have been running hot. Sensex and Nifty have touched new highs. This year, Indian stock markets made a new record. They became the third most expensive market in the world. India was right behind the US and Japan. And this record-breaking bull run triggered FOMO among investors. FOMO, as you would know, is a fear of missing out. So investors felt that if they did not jump in, they'd miss an opportunity, a chance to make a quick buck. Now, these are all, there are all kinds of investors out there. All of them want to make money, of course. But some see stock markets as an easy route to exponential wealth. And for this, they engage in speculative trading, using complex instruments like futures and options. Apparently, millions of people are doing this now, and this has led to a frenzy. So Indian regulators are trying to tame it by introducing more guardrails and more rules. SEBI has prepared a plan. That's Securities and Exchange Board of India, SEBI. SEBI is India's market regulator. It is going after speculative trading. It is raising the entry bar for doing such trade. Here's what SEBI has recommended. The minimum contract size be raised. Earlier it was $18,000, the new limit could be $24,000. And one more change has been proposed. Stock exchanges could be asked to offer fewer contracts. So the goal of this entire exercise is quite clear, to contain futures and options trading. And this is also known as derivative trading. What is that? Let me explain. Usually when you buy a stock, you buy it on the basis of its current market value, the asking price. That's what you buy it for. But derivative trading is like making a bet on how the price of a stock might behave in future. You're betting on that, on its future prospect. 
So here's what happens. In this case, in derivative trading, investors do not buy shares. They make agreements. They buy contracts. Contracts based on their prediction of how a stock might perform. If their prediction is right, they make money. If their prediction is wrong, they lose money. It's a gamble and a risky one. And here is how one board member of SEBI describes it. Let me quote from what has been said. If you want to gamble, if you need diabetes and high blood pressure, then go into this market. So derivatives are not for everyone. There is a high chance that you'd lose your money. But that has not stopped people from gambling their savings on derivatives. And India has seen a huge surge in such trades. In fact, let me show you some more data. Last year, in 2023, Indian investors traded 85 billion options contracts. An option is like a promise to buy a stock at a certain price in future. If a stock reaches a particular price, you buy it. That's the promise you make. 85 billion options contracts. In 2023, they were traded in India, 85 billion. That's the highest in the world. In fact, India accounted for 84% of all equity options contracts traded globally. So who is driving this boom? The retail investors, that's people like you and me. They account for 35% of all options trade. And they're losing money big time. 90%, 90% of all active retail investors have suffered a big loss due to derivative trading. In March 2022, investors lost some $5.4 billion from derivatives. These trends are alarming. SEBI says that people are betting their household savings on derivatives. India's Reserve Bank is also worried about this trend. It says investors have been borrowing money to speculate in the market. India's finance minister has cautioned investors in the past about this. Here's what Nirmala Sitaraman said in the month of May, and I'm quoting. Any unchecked explosion in retail trading of futures and options can create future challenges, not just for the markets, but for the investor sentiments and also for household finances. Again, what has caused this surge? Well, two things primarily. First is the explosion of stock trading apps. They've made trading easy, even for complex instruments like derivatives. Thanks to these apps, it's as easy as transferring money, so more people are doing it. The second reason is the Finfluencers. There is a rising number of content creators dishing out stock market advice on the internet. Retail investors have been falling prey to them. In July, SEBI ordered a crackdown. It warned 20 such Finfluencers. But now it wants to resort to tougher measures. It wants to change the rules of the game itself. Now, there is no denying that the Indian investor has matured over the past decade. More Indians are ready to take risks instead of keeping their money in the bank. They're more willing to invest in the stock market, which is a good thing. But retail investors are also a vulnerable lot. And the allure of easy money can be a trap. So it's good to see the regulators doing more to protect their interests. Our next story is from Pakistan, from the Balochistan province. It's the largest region of Pakistan. It has an abundance of mineral wealth. But the Baloch people are among the country's most impoverished. For decades, they have been neglected by Pakistan's politicians and repressed by the country's all-powerful military. But the Baloch people have not given up. In fact, it's quite the opposite. At this very moment, as we speak, the Baloch people are protesting in Pakistan. A Baloch national gathering is underway in the port town of Gwadar. Thousands have already gathered there. Many more want to join them. But the Pakistani state is doing everything it can to shut down the protests. The gathering began last week. People from all across Balochistan were invited. They were supposed to get to Gwadar by Sunday. Why Gwadar? Because it's the site of a major port. The Chinese built the Gwadar port. It is a key part of China's Belt and Road Initiative. The protesters know that a demonstration here, a demonstration in Gwadar, will get the world's attention. <laughs> Thousands took to the highways in colorful caravans. 
They were making their way to Gwadar from across Balochistan, but their path was blocked by the Pakistani security forces. There were roadblocks and checkpoints. Progress was slow, the caravans were held up, but the Baloch people persevered. So the Pakistani forces defaulted to a tried and tested method, violence. A caravan was fired upon in the town of Mastung, near the provincial capital Quetta. <laughs> At least 14 people were injured here. Five of them were in a critical state. Reports say other convoys were also attacked all over Balochistan. The visuals you see are from social media, from the groups organizing the Baloch protests. They kept uploading the videos as proof of Pakistan's heavy-handed approach. So Pakistan imposed a complete internet shutdown in Gwadar. Roads to the port city were blocked. It was a siege-like situation. And then it seems that the Pakistani forces ran riot. Here's what, what an organizer of the protest said last night. I am Maran Baloch, the organizer of Baloch Security Committee. I am addressing you all from Gwadar. Gwadar is under siege from the last four days. In Gwadar, military has taken over the streets and it has injured many people and abducted more than 500 people. And we still don't have the data that how many people are injured because the hospitals are sealed and the injured people have no access for their uh, health facilities. Why is Pakistan cracking down on this gathering? Why is Islamabad terrorizing its own citizens? To understand that, you need to look at the situation in Balochistan. I would mentioned earlier that the province was rich in minerals. It is also the largest province in Pakistan and the least populated. There are just about 15 million Baloch people in Pakistan. Out of the total population of about 240 million, 240 million Pakistanis, only 50 million Baloch people. So the Baloch people have abundant resources and they aren't too many in number. This should have resulted in them being rich. Just looking at the resources per capita. But that is not the case. The Balochistan province has been thoroughly exploited, but the benefits have not been passed on to the locals. The wealth has always flowed to Islamabad. Now with the Gwadar port, it will flow to Beijing and the locals won't see a dime. That is one of the reasons why the Baloch people are angry. Another reason is enforced disappearances. Whenever the Baloch people protest, the Pakistani state abducts their leaders. The protest organizers just disappear. And this has happened across decades. Families have been torn apart. Fathers and brothers have been taken in the dead of night, never to return. So you'll notice that many of the present generation of Baloch protesters are women. They've been fighting for years, demanding to know what happened to their families. The Pakistani forces have tried to abduct these leaders too, but public pressure has helped keep these women safe so far. These protesters want an end to the abductions. They want a share of Balochistan's wealth, and they want the Baloch people to be afforded dignity. Until that happens, the protests are likely to continue. It's not easy being the host, especially when you are entertaining the King of England. And France is slowly realizing this. Last year, France welcomed King Charles for a state dinner. French President Emmanuel Macron pulled out all the stops. The event was extravagant. The leaders clinked their glasses and feasted on blue lobster and fine cheese. But now the French auditor has released a report and it says that the dinner cost $515,000. That's right, more than half a million dollars of French public money so that the King of England could enjoy more opulence. It is a shocking sum. But was the cost of this dinner an anomaly? How much do state dinners cost and why? Here's a report. Have you ever wanted to attend a party really badly but couldn't? If this were the 1700s, that party would probably have been held here. This is the Hall of Mirrors, in the Palace of Versailles in France. Centuries ago, this room was party central for the French monarchy. They blew large sums of money, threw balls, and entertained foreign guests. France's ill-fated monarchy is no longer there. 
but the Hall of Mirrors still is. And it continues to show a mirror to French society. Because this country is a financial mess. Public debt is 110% of the GDP. Yet, the party goes on. Last September, France entertained the King of England. President Emmanuel Macron pulled out all the stops for the monarch's visit. In Your Majesty's honor, Her Majesty Queen Camilla, as well as your family, I raise the glass in honor of the United Kingdom. Long live Franco-British friendship. I cannot tell you how delighted my wife and I are to be with you this evening, and how touched we are by the magnificent welcome that was given to us. We're only finding out now just how delighted Charles must have been. France's public auditor has published a new report. It says that the dinner held to welcome Charles cost $515,000. That's more than half a million dollars of public money. Why? So that King Charles and his wife could feast on blue lobster, crab cakes, champagne marinated chicken and fine cheese. The catering alone cost $180,000, plus $46,000 for drinks, on top of other costs including furniture, flowers and decorations. So food and flowers have helped plunge the Elysi Palace's budget $9 million into the red. This comes after last month's warning, when the European Union practically scolded France over its budget deficit, which stands at 5.5% of the GDP and is one of the highest in the Union. So the audit office is now being a grouch. It's asking France to rein in the spending. But that may be a tough ask. We aren't saying this. The dining trend is. In July last year, France held a state dinner for Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. The cost came to $447,000. Though not everyone gets such lavish treatment. This year, when Chinese President Xi Jinping was welcomed in a state dinner, it cost France around $149,000. Now, state dinners are almost always expensive, and not just in France. In 2009, the Obama administration held a state dinner for then-Indian Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. It cost a whopping $572,000. Cheers. The next year, then-Mexican President Felipe Calderón was invited. It cost the U.S. about $563,000. The U.K. has a similar story. In 2019, it invited Donald Trump. The bill came up to $556,000. So, across nations, across decades, the money averages around half a million dollars for any foreign guest of importance. Why? Thanks to dinner diplomacy, state dinners are a big deal. Preparations take months. No detail is overlooked. The event is extravagant. While state dinners can help strengthen ties between countries, there is a payoff. The leaders wine and dine, but it's the public that foots the bill. Elon Musk once admitted that he, was, he has OCD. OCD is obsessive compulsive disorder. He says that he's obsessed with product. He can only see what's wrong. But lately, the Tesla CEO has a new obsession. It's Nicolas Maduro, the president of Venezuela. Just look at his tweets. In the last four days, Musk has tweeted about him 50 times, 5 zero, 50 times. Imagine that. What explains this tweet frenzy? Are they new BFFs or is there something more to this? On Sunday, Venezuela announced the results of its presidential election. Of course, Maduro won. He's ruled the country for 11 years and he's been accused of rigging the election. So no one was surprised. The opposition cried foul and claimed victory. They alleged voter fraud and fighting their cause was Elon Musk. On Sunday, he took to X and he wrote, shame on dictator Maduro. The next morning, he wrote that Maduro had committed election fraud. 
Now, for most people, two posts would be good enough. You've made your point and you move on. But Elon Musk is not most people. His ethos is overkill and his posts weren't all civil. Look at this one. Here's what it says. I'm coming for you, Maduro. I will carry you to Gitmo on a donkey. Imagine saying that to a world leader. Maduro did not respond. But 48 posts later, he'd had enough. So the Venezuelan president challenged Elon Musk to a fight. Elon Musk, whoever messes with me dries up. Whoever messes with Venezuela dries up. Elon Musk, you want to fight? Let's have it. Elon Musk, I am ready. I am a son of Bolivar and Chavez. I am not afraid of you. Elon Musk, let's go at it wherever you want. He's a leader. So the ball is now in Elon Musk's court, and soon the suspense ended. Musk tweeted, he accepts the challenge, and he also raised the stakes. Elon Musk said if he wins, Maduro must resign. If he loses, he will give the Venezuelan president a free trip to Mars. Maduro is yet to respond, and we don't blame him. He's just rigged an election. His country is up in arms. There's international outcry. He clearly has bigger problems than sucker punching Elon Musk. But this isn't Musk's first rodeo. In 2022, he challenged the Russian president to a duel. Of course, Putin ignored him. Then in 2023, Musk chose a more suitable opponent, Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg. He challenged Zuckerberg to a cage match. Zuckerberg agreed. But unfortunately for the world, the two never made it to a ring. So you can understand Elon Musk's modus operandi. He ridicules you. He challenges you. He makes a fuss about it. But when it comes down to getting his hands dirty, he scoots. Nowhere to be found. Classic bully behavior. But the question is, why Nicolas Maduro? You see, Maduro runs a socialist government in Venezuela. He is a symbol of the left. Musk believes that socialist forces are ruining the world. He believes the left is degrading society. So that puts him at odds with Maduro. Plus, Maduro is the perfect target. Elon Musk has nothing to lose here. Venezuela does not have a Tesla factory. It doesn't have Tesla stores. There are no Starlink satellites in the country, plus very few advertisers for X. So all of Elon Musk's companies are in the clear. In boxing terms, Venezuela is what you would call a soft target. Elon Musk can pull all the punches he wants. It won't hurt him. But he won't try something like this with China. Musk would never even though Xi Jinping is as much a dictator as Nicolas Maduro and way more dangerous. But Musk won't call him out, let alone challenge him. Because Beijing is crucial for Tesla. His money is at stake there. And that's what this bravado really boils down to. It's not about who throws the hardest punch. It's about posturing. It's about publicity. And who knows that better than Elon Musk? He's drawn to chaos like a honeybee to nectar. He's either arguing with random ex-users or sharing conspiracy theories or challenging world leaders to duels. Musk is what Gen Z would call a Karen, overdramatic and always ready to put on a spectacle one tweet at a time. Our next story tonight is about the tea of the town, matcha. The bright green colored powder. Matcha is a type of tea. It originated in Japan and for generations it has been consumed in traditional tea ceremonies. But now matcha is having its moment the world over. Celebrities are raving about it. Social media is filled with matcha trends. And the tea has gone through a complete makeover. There are matcha lattes, chocolates, ice creams, even energy drinks. Its global market is valued at more than $2 billion. So how did matcha take over the world? And is it actually healthy for you? Our next report spills the tea. Walk into any coffee shop or a health food store, maybe even your neighborhood grocery shop, and you're almost guaranteed to find this green goodness. This bright jade-colored powder that's mixed into lattes, milkshakes, smoothies, sodas, even energy drinks, ice cream, pancakes and chocolates. We're talking about matcha. It is everywhere. Which is surprising because not too long ago, matcha had an image of being niche and elusive. So, what is matcha? It's a type of green tea. It comes in powdered form. Matcha originated in Japan, where it has been traditionally used in tea ceremonies. 
It's derived from the leaves of the Camellia sinensis plant. This is the same plant that gives us a lot of other teas. But matcha is cultivated in an unusual way. The plant is shaded from excessive sunlight. This lets the plant produce more chlorophyll, the green pigment, which gives matcha its bright green colour. At the same time, the process gives matcha its pungent taste. What many matcha tea lovers call an earthy taste. And this is what makes matcha a hit. For generations, matcha has been treated like a country-wide family secret. But now, matcha is having its moment. It's now spotted in the hands of celebrities. It's a rage on social media and it has birthed not just memes but also experimentations. People drink matcha hot or cold, with or without alcohol, in its traditional form or even with a twist of other flavours like lavender. They are ordering it online or going to popular coffee chains, most of which have their own matcha variant. Clearly, matcha madness is everywhere. Matcha's global market is valued at $2.3 billion and it's expected to reach $3 billion in the next four years. What's behind this popularity? Well, there are three main reasons. First, marketing. Whether it's matcha boba tea or Kit Kat, the green tea is now being seen as a youthful, trendy product. Secondly, its boom comes amid the rise in popularity of Asian culture as a whole, from K-pop to bubble tea. The third reason is the range of health benefits. Matcha is called an antioxidant-packed superfood. Research shows that matcha can help prevent cancer, it can improve memory and reduce stress and anxiety. This doesn't mean that matcha is a magic potion, just that it can aid in wellness. And this seems to be good enough to persuade anyone to become a matcha fiend. But this tea can be especially good for people who are trying to cut their caffeine intake. Because matcha has lesser caffeine component than coffee or regular tea. That being said, matcha is not for everyone. Critics say that matcha may be great, but it's no competitor to coffee. After all, the coffee market is worth about $130 billion. Plus, matcha's taste has fueled many debates. While matcha lovers drink it for the earthy taste, critics say it simply tastes like grass. But, grassiness or not, matcha seems to be the tea of the town. I know these are depressing times to watch the news. It's always war or pandemic or death. But even all, amid all this gloom, there is a saving grace, the internet. Whether it's a serious political event or a tense sports competition, you can trust the internet to crack a joke. So starting tonight, we are adding a new segment to our show. We'll take a look at what the internet is joking about. Let's meet today's subject, an Olympic shooter from Turkey. I will show you his picture, but first, look at what a typical shooter looks like. You've got special eye covers, fancy ear protection, sometimes even headgear. Now look at our Turkish shooter. He's 51 years old, no eye cover, no visible ear protection, and he's got his hand inside his pocket. That's a boss move right there. He could hit the target or hit the golf course. And guess what? His team won the silver medal at the Paris Games. So what's going on here? Well, the internet has a theory. They think the shooter is actually a hitman, a former gun for hire. A spoiler alert, he is not. He used to serve in the Turkish military, but that hasn't stopped the barrage of memes. Take a look. Now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. Wildfires in Rome surprise residents, sparking evacuation. Paris offers a tour of this year's Olympic sites on a boat made of Lego bricks. 
and being a parliamentarian could be a stressful job. But Jenny, the golden retriever, is making it easy for those in the UK Parliament. Finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day in 1936, Adolf Hitler declared the Berlin Olympics open. Several nations threatened to boycott the event, but the Nazis promised to remove an, any anti-Semitic si signage there. So finally, 5,000 athletes from 51 countries took part in the Games. We're leaving you on that note. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Across continents, one powerful news source. Bringing you diverse perspectives on the issues that matter. We go beyond the boundaries to give you that little extra about every sporting moment. So thank you for making First Post 5 million strong. We're counting on your support and you can trust us to bring you the news unfiltered and unvarnished. One tree for humanity. One tree for Mother Earth. One tree for our future. Project One Tree, a News 18 Network initiative. Hello and welcome to First Post America. I'm Eric Hamm, coming to you live from the nation's capital.